Hi, I'm Carl, and in this video we're going to have a look at questions 69 to 72 in section 3 of the purple booklet. So we're going to start off with question 69, which is about the formation of bromoethane from ethene. So I've given the equation here and some of the relevant information for the question. Again, you're given more than you need uh, for this one, uh, but I've copied all the stuff you need out here. Question 69 says, if more hydrogen bromide is added to the reaction mixture after equilibrium has been established, the value of the equilibrium constant will be what? Well, remember the equilibrium constant is what will eventually happen um, no matter what you do to the changing the concentrations uh, of the reactants. So some people might think if you're increasing this and you're increasing the denominator of this fraction and therefore the value for the constant will change. But remember, it's a constant. The excess HBr you're adding in will react with the leftover ethane and cause more bromoethane to be produced. So the constant will remain the same. So let me write in then that the answer for 69 is going to be um, equal to 7.5 times 10 to the 7 is not going to change. You're not going to expect any change because any excess HBr you add in is just going to react with any of the leftover ethene. Question 70 then is the rate of the reaction forming bromoethane doubles if the initial concentration of ethene is doubled and the initial reaction of hydrogen bromide is the same. And then it quadruples if the initial concentration of hydrogen bromide is doubled and the initial concentration of ethene is the same. So the way I like to think of this sort of question is to look at ratios. If you double the amount of ethene, then the rate doubles. Therefore, there's a one-to-one -one ratio between the concentration of ethene and the rate of the reaction. But if you double the amount of hydrogen bromide, the rate quadruples. Therefore, there's a two-to-one ratio between the concentration of HBr and the increase in rate in reaction. Therefore, you can say that the reaction is going to be first order with respect to ethene and second order with respect to HBr. And that can help get an equation because we know that the rate equation is going to be rate equals K and multiplied by the concentration of, we'll just put them as A and B. That's just the general rate equation, but you raise those to the power of the orders here. So if we were to say that A was ethene, and B is hydrogen bromide. We know that the rate is going to be first order with respect to ethene and second order with respect to HBr, which means the answer for 70 is going to be A. And then 71 asks, which of the following is a correct statement about the formation of bromoethane? So let's go through them one by one and eliminate them as we go. So. The reaction only occurs at temperatures higher than 298 Kelvin. So looking at the Gibbs free energy, we were told this is going to be at 298 Kelvin. And given that as negative, um, we know it's going to be spontaneous at that temperature. So it does occur at 298 Kelvin, so A is not true. B then says the entropy change for the reaction is positive because there's less disorder in the product. Well, entropy, of course, is a measure of disorder, but you wouldn't expect um, a positive entropy change for this reaction. The next says, uh, this is option C, the reaction does not occur spontaneously because the change in Gibbs free energy is negative. Reactions occur spontaneously when the Gibbs free energy is negative, so this isn't true. And then D says the reaction recurs spontaneously as the enthalpy change dominates the effect of the entropy change. And while of course you are going from two molecules essentially to one, in equilibrium and that's going against what entropy um, might want. The enthalpy change does dominate that and allows it to be favourable at that temperature. So we know the answer to 71 then is going to be D. So moving on to question 72 which is about a fish and its blood circulation. Um, I've drawn a bad diagram of this here but it says that 15% of the circulation for each ventricular contraction 
goes each to the head, liver, gut, and kidneys. So the way to think of this then is that if you've got 15% here and 15% here and 15% here and 15% here, what way is this blood going to move? And we're looking at the blood flow through the liver. So we know that directly going to the liver, we've got 15% of the blood flow. So we can write that down. But we also want to add on anything that's connected to it. And we can see that the liver gets some blood supply from the gut. And if 15% of the blood supply passes through the gut, and we're also told to assume that all the blood is just confined to the vessels and organs, that we can assume that this 15% is going to pass through straight into the liver after it's gone through the gut, which means we've got two lots of 15% to add up. So that means we've got 30% of the blood flow of the fish for each ventricular contraction going through the liver. And that in this question is going to be answer D. So there was a couple more questions. I hope that helped.